Okay, so we're recording now. U.S. soccer is built very much on the shoulders of giants, and we are joined by one of those giants today. This is a bona fide U.S. soccer someone who has been instrumental in bringing about the soccer culture that we all uh, enjoy today. He's somehow, all of these things are true, a U.S. Open Cup winning goalkeeper, an NCAA finalist coach, a World Cup assistant coach, a, a broadcasting breath of fresh air, if we do say so, a teacher, oh, baby. a refereeing icon, a U.S. Soccer Hall of Famer, and an actual PhD. <laughs> Unbelievable. Welcome to the show, Dr. Joe Macknick. Very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I always love to uh, speak with uh, fans of U.S. soccer, both the men's and women's team, and you forgot to mention the five-a-side team. Of course, of course, yes. Which, which a lot of people don't know much about five-a-side, which is now called futsal. But um, back in 89, um, we took the five-a-side team to Holland and participated in the first world championship before it was called a World Cup and uh, won a bronze medal uh, coming in third place. Um, so that was a big accomplishment because uh, some of the people that were on that team were like Mike Windishman, Bruce Murray, Todd Ramos, Peter Burmese, and you know that was their first real uh, winning experience uh, with, and they brought some of that into the 1990 team. Um, so that was, uh, it was fun to be with those guys. So what, how does that come about? Because you obviously have the, um, you know, giant of uh, mainstream soccer, but you also have these other things. You also worked in uh, MISL for a long time. Um, how does that, how does that work? And, and why were Americans able to be successful in that field? Well, I think, um, you know, you're talking um, quite some time ago. And there were lots of opportunities uh, back then because the game was just emerging. And uh, I was a college coach, college player, college coach, and then um, took uh, the opportunity to participate in the first ever U.S. soccer coaching school, which was uh, conducted by a German coach, Detmar Kramer. And that was in 1970. He came from the World Cup in Mexico right to uh, Rhode Island, and he conducted three one-week courses. And that's where the first licenses were granted, the A, the B, the C. So I was fortunate. Have, now I'm coaching in Connecticut at that time, and, and so myself and a few others went and were in that first course. And then, you know, we became uh, staff members of the coaching school later on. And uh, Walter Chizowitz, who I had known uh, because I played junior ball for the New York Ukrainians in, in, New York, in the German American League. So I knew him. He became director of coaching. And the whole thing is connected. Uh, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's timing, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Sometimes it's who you know. But I think for me, and this is going to sound pompous, uh, I think for me. Um, Go for uh, it, Dr. Joe. Go for it. <laughs> Put him on blast, Dr. Joe. I think um, whenever I set my mind to doing something, people knew that they could count on me to get the job done. Um, and, and so I really put everything I had into all of those um, responsibilities or adventures. And certainly some of them were real adventures. Uh, and it all worked out for the best. Uh, and here we are, how many, 50 years later. The resume speaks for itself, man. There's no way that you're not that type of person, given the, the various things that you've accomplished. And it's incredible. And I just want to just kind of set the stage here by starting with gratitude for you taking the time um, to speak with us. Uh, well, for, first, for everything that you've done to contribute to U.S. soccer, <laughs> the, the, the culture that I love so much and that has been such a positive thing in my life and I think the lives of everyone sort of experiencing this conversation with us and then in addition to all that to find time to speak to some rinky dink podcast that just <laughs> means well is is really special and, and we're really grateful to have you on well you got it all wrong because I don't consider your podcast rinky dink 
And maybe that's part of the success story because there's nothing that I could, anybody who lives and loves soccer, I would never consider them rinky dink. And that like even to the soccer camp that I started so long ago. I mean, the kids that came, they were, they were special. They were, they were paying money. They were, they were trying to learn. So you, you didn't consider anything. I never considered anything rinky dink and wouldn't agree to be on the air with you if I took it. As, <laughs> I took it as a rinky dink uh, operation. So let me, let me ask you connected to that. So I feel like there's a lot of, um, like self-deprecation in American soccer because we we don't have necessarily the you know grand history of of European soccer, but so what was it like you know in your your um, era playing coaching starting all this stuff working for MLS like did you feel like we had something to prove or did you always feel that we're just as good as them and we're we're just you know at a different part in our growth or a different do we have different characteristics. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, certainly, back in the um, in the you know the days of the North American Soccer League, the NASL, and there were not that many American players playing in the league. Uh, in fact, they had a rule that you had to have three Americans on the field at all times, but one of them was always the goalkeeper, and the other two were probably back defenders. Uh, and 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 Ricky Davis was a an unusual situation because he was, you know, could play up front. Um, we as coaches growing up back then, you know, they brought a lot of uh, second division European players over some second division coaches. And, and we, um, we felt we could coach as, as well as they could, or as good as that, you know, cause, and, and especially, you know, knowing, knowing the country and knowing the American players, knowing, uh, you know, everything. So we, yeah, back then it was about proving yourself. Absolutely. Um, when when uh, we took the five-a-side team that I mentioned earlier to Holland, before the tournament, uh, FIFA sat everyone down individually and as a group. So uh, the uh, technical director for FIFA back then is a guy who is a gentleman is named Walter Gag. So he sat down with uh, head coach John Kowalski and myself, and he said, what does the USA expect to accomplish uh, by being at the you know, first five-a-side championship? And I said, uh, we're, we're, we're here to win. You know, we're, we're here to we're, we're win the whole thing. And he took it like a joke, like I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, we're here to win. You know, and we had a little bit of, uh, um, we were ahead of the rest of the world with indoor a little bit because of the, uh, MISL. And granted, it was a different game. We were playing on AstroTurf on top of ice with boards, but we knew about time penalties. We knew about substitution on the fly. We knew, you know, we knew that you would try to match lines, uh, you know, so from, from hockey. So we had a little pop uh, on some of the red. We even substituted goalkeeper on a penalty kick uh, because our regular goalie was uh, AJ Lakowiecki. He was small. And um, he, we gave up a goal on a penalty kick, and it went flew right by him. So on the next penalty kick in a different game, we put in Dave Vanoli, and Dave was national team goalkeeper right, right, way right. back, and he was a huge man, barrel-chested huge man, and he just went like this and covered practically the whole indoor goal. <laughs> the guy took the shot and hit him. <laughs> and, uh, it was, um, you know, a revelation to everyone else that you could substitute the goalkeeper, you know, and then we, as soon as we could, we got him out. <laughs> so, so one of the things that makes American soccer unique is its ability to embrace the new. And I think, you know, I've seen MLS do that a lot. And to, for example, trying out VAR um, ahead of some of the rest of the leagues in the world. Um, but we've also seen MLS try out stuff that never stuck with the rest of the world. You know what the I mean? Shot the countdown um, clock. The, uh, the shootouts, yeah, the, the halfway penalty kicks and such. Um, talk to me about the role of like innovation in, in soccer and kind of how you can get that right and wrong. Well, let's talk about MLS. So I joined MLS at the end of year one, uh, actually Labor Day weekend of the end of the first season. And then so I was with them from year two to year 16, I think. So um, when I got there, there was we had the uh, 
the time of the game was kept on the scoreboard. You know, the official time was on the scoreboard, not in the referee's hand. And that created lots of problem because the players knew how much time exactly was left. So, you know, there would be deliberate kicks, kicking of the ball out of bounds to waste the, you know, 20, 30 seconds. And then there was pressure on the referee to stop the clock. And that was, you know, then do I stop it? Don't I stop it? If I do, uh, you know, then what if there's a goal scored and now it's on me, maybe I should, there was no rule. And then we, of course, we had the tiebreaker, the shootout that you mentioned, five seconds to score from 35 yards created lots of problems. Um, the referees hated it because uh, you couldn't do a perfect 90 minutes, not that that existed, but you could do a, a good 90 minutes and then screw up the shootout and then the, your, whole, your whole thing went down the tubes. The players hated it. If you look at it, you see many players, after they tried it once or twice, they didn't want to do it any longer. There was a, a much lower success rate than in to kicks from the mark. Uh, and there was also an injury factor. There were many collisions between the goalkeeper and the, and the uh, t player taking the shootout attempt. So, and the fans hated it as well. It's really <laughs> hard, to, it's hard to comprehend because the shootout in hockey, ice hockey, right. is what? Everybody what? loves it. Yeah, it, yeah. It, right? And, but, in, but in soccer, you know, and, and, you know, it was like, why are we trying to Americanize the game? The people that followed MLS originally were diehard, diehard uh, purist fans. They wanted the European game. They, 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 knew what, they knew what a good tie looked like, you know, like where, and, and they knew that teams could play differently on the road to get a point and all of those things. So we eventually got rid of the uh, shootout. I... After year two, I actually brought the shootout clock, took the took it out of the referee's uh, stopwatch, and put a real shootout clock. They cost ten thousand dollars a piece. And we had <laughs> we had ten we had ten clubs, I think, and at that time, and so a hundred grand on my budget. So, so and that lasted, I think, Damn one year or two. And you know what happened to those shootout clocks? What? Many teams, some teams, were charging people five dollars for one shot at the clock with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Dude, you should have back. you should have bought Apple stock. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think that those attempts at innovation are always worth it because you just never know when you're going to come up with something that that is worthwhile. I mean, do, do you agree? Do you think that it was foolish to try that or was it the right idea? Um, you know, and we got the negative reaction from all of the, from everyone. But now you're right about like VAR, MLS was part of the original VAR experiment. The, the first real game with VAR was played in MLS, right? So, and they've done it really well. They've done it better than most of the world. And uh, part of it is because of Howard Webb uh, has come over to, you know, to, to run it. Part of it is because Mark Geiger is uh, very, very special with understanding the laws and, 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 uh, and, and teaching. Another uh, gentleman, Greg Barkey, who was an assistant referee, uh, you know, runs it with the assist. So they, they got it down right really well. But what they have done was to make it work is they've set a really, really high bar of to what is a clear and obvious error. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so has Germany for that matter. Yeah, yeah. The, the rest of the world is struggling. So like in Germany, now uh, they would like have one really uh, on-field review where the referee goes to the camera, maybe one every three games. I, and then in like Liga Max, which I did some right. games, right, right. we're having three on-field reviews per half. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, and there was, and there was nine, nine minutes added time at the end of the first half. Right. You know, which is unheard of. So to try to get a, a standard of, you know, what's clear and obvious error. That's the whole, that's the whole uh, focus of to get VAR right.
What do it's referees a, think of the of the VAR revolution? They like it for the most part. You would think the opposite because you would say, oh, people are looking over my shoulder, but they like it because it prevents, it's a parachute for them, it's a crutch. So you're out there knowing that it's easy to make a mistake on one of the, you know, the three or four pivotal calls in the game, penalty kick or no penalty kick, right. Uh, right. red card or yellow card, right. Right. Uh, offside or not offside, uh, goal line or, you know, on the line or over the line. And, you know, human error, you can make a, you can make a mistake in any one of those four. You just, it depends on your angle, you know, your positioning, the whole deal. So with the VAR, you know that if you've made this critical match decision mistake that can determine the outcome of a match, you got the guy in the VAR booth saying, hey, maybe you'd need to take another look. And you can go to the camera and take a look. Um, and, you know, look, the World Cup has 32 cameras. So <laughs> you're going to get your best it's up to the VAR to provide the best angles for you when you go look. Um, MLS is a little bit tougher. They only have it six to eight to 10 cameras for different stadiums, but you're still going to get a, another choice, another angle. And that angle might be the, the one that uh, changes your mind or reinforces your decision to and stay. I think, and I get the sense that referees are the types of people who like justice and the truth. Right? You would hope. <laughs> <laughs> hope so. Okay. I want to get this one out of the way super quick, Dr. Joe. Today is January 28th in the year 2001 at 1 19 p.m. Eastern Time. What is, in this moment, a handball? Great question. And you know that, uh, you, you know what IFAB is, right? The International Federation of foot, you know, Football, where they make up the laws for FIFA. So they'll be reviewing handball again uh, at the end of the month at their annual general meeting uh, because they're still trying to um, get it right. Um, so they've really messed it up a little bit recently because now they've put a different standard for attacking handball versus defensive handball. So like any attacking handball that leads to a goal or an immediate goal scoring chance, even if that handball was accidental, is to be whistled as a foul. Whereas accidental handball when committed on the part of the defender is not a foul. So there's already, you know, what's, not, what's good for one is not good for the other and vice versa. The only thing positive I've seen recently in handling two things. Um, in the most recent rule changes, they finally figured out that if a player deliberately plays the ball with his foot, his thigh, his chest, his head, and it happens to then hit his hand, and there has been no movement of the hand to the ball, that that player shouldn't be penalized for that. I mean, you, I'm sure you all have played, right? So, so you could, and then boom, right? Except even if the hand is above the head in this unnatural position, off, off, off the head, hits the hand, that's not a hand. It's hard to sell that because it's been called handling for a century, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. As, a, as opposed to, okay, this is un, I mean, 100%. Hand above your shoulder, arm above your shoulder. Now, if it comes off the other player's head or body, foot, whatever, it's handling. But if it comes off your head or hand, it's not handling. So that's that's uh, another, you asked me what's handling and what's not. So there's two examples of part of the confusion. Uh, the only really good thing that they've done is they finally let me get my rule book. I'll show you. Yes, He's Dr. Rule Joe's book, rule book. Folks. It's I happening. <laughs> this is happening. I even have it underlined. Wait, I'll show you. Wait, I'll show you how. It... <laughs> All right. Uh, one twelve. So they have a diagram. This is the first time. This diagram. A <laughs> hundred years. I'm taking a screenshot, folks. This will be up on the Twitter. We will show you what Dr. Joe sees. I've, 
<laughs> oh, my yeah. word. Well, they show you that if the ball hits your shoulder within the underarm, you know, within the distance of the underarm, so to speak, that that's not handling. It's okay. But, um, oh, God. You know, say, but everything else. So it's wild, right? How is it possible that this can cause so much controversy? But I guess it, you know, when you get down to the details of anything, we can get, we can get philosophical and things can get confusing if everyone cares enough to, to talk about it and if it matters to everyone, you know? Well, it matters because uh, the handling that we're talking about most often is handling in the penalty area. Right. So, so, so it's... It, you know, if it's called on the defender, it's a penalty kick. Could even be a send off if it's done on the goal line. So, so, so you're, uh, so you're um, deciding the outcome of the game. Right. If essentially, right. you know, games are <laughs> one goal games. So you call a penalty wrongly, or you don't call a penalty on the one you should have. It could determine the outcome of the game. And the handling is one of those things that uh, it's very, so, very controversial. So IFAB comes out with these rules. They send you a beautiful, you know, printed booklet that it very clearly explains what they're asking for. Why do all the referees decide on their own, like, version? Like, it, we see these rollouts, like, every time there's a rule change, some referees are doing it, some, some leagues are doing it, some aren't. W what's the deal with that? Soccer is supposed to be played under the 17 laws of the game. But there's different interpretations. Uh, it's a big world. Uh, just, like, <laughs> just, just like soccer is played differently in Brazil than it is in England. So refereeing in Brazil is different than it is in England. And, and um, you want it to be the same, but it's impossible. You know, Can you tell used, me? There used to be, let me just, there used to be the two men or two person refereeing system. You know, mm. that. Maybe, mm -hmm. Way back when I played college, it was that's how the game was officiated. So you you would have one referee with a Scottish background, American Scott, another guy from South America. You didn't know what the next call was going to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. You've worked with so many referees over the years and interacted with so many. What what makes people have that drive to be a referee, and and what makes someone a good referee? Um, playing experience is important. Um, real um, understanding of the game, obviously, is very, very important. A feel for the game, uh, what the Germans call Fingerspitzengefühl. Okay. <laughs> All right? Right, so, right. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah. A feel for the game is really, really important. Um, why would you... Why would you want it? I was a goalkeeper. You probably know that. So, so being there's like a correlation between goalkeeping and refereeing oh. uh, that, you know, I've actually written about it a little bit. Uh, when you're the goalkeeper, you're out there by yourself. You're alone. Uh, you, if you make a mistake, it could determine the outcome of the game. You're often blamed uh, for stuff and rarely do, are you given credit for, you know, if you make a good save, we'll say, okay, that's his job. Okay. The same thing a referee. You're out there by yourself. The pressure is the same. Um, you, you, you're, you make a good call. Of the, that's expected because that, that's your job. But you miss a call or you make a wrong decision then, you know, you, and possibly determine the outcome, then you're, you're, you know, you're terrible. So uh, I think the pressure is great. Um, and it's, you just get a wonderful feeling uh, at the end of the game if, well, you think you've done a good game, but if you get representation from each team, um, especially the losing team, um, or in some cases the visiting team, uh, if, they, if they think they got a fair shake, the losing team and the visiting team, then you've done a pretty good job. And, and if you happen to, if they say, you know, good job, ref, thanks, you walk up mm. to you've played a really good game. Mm. You get the same, you know, 
And you love it, you know, you just love yeah. it. Yeah, you know, I've never heard it described that way. It's always sounded, I've always just assumed it to be an unappealing job, you know, because <laughs> it would be for me. Uh, I couldn't, I wouldn't be into it. But you compare it to the goalkeeping, there's a certain psychology of of these very high pressure, critical moments. And you're, you're the referee is the steward of this game that we love, right? In a way, the right. most the most important uh, person on right. the field is right. is the referee. Yeah, not, not only... Not only is he or she, uh, you're depending on him to, or to apply the laws, but also how the game is played. Um, so in essence, there, the referee is in charge of the quality of play uh, because if, if he or she allows the game to deteriorate, doesn't apply the law, doesn't catch the fouls, doesn't caution where cautions are, are necessary, the game deteriorates into a, a bloodbath or a you know, a cat fest then, uh, I mean, there's nothing as ugly as an ugly soccer game, you know, when it really goes south. Um, so, so the referees got is a big part of making sure that the quality of play is high and the protection of players is important. So I want to switch gears a little bit and go to a totally separate aspect of your career. So this incredible career. If you go to Dr. Joe's Wikipedia, it looks like someone took like five different people and just put it in a blender. Because you've got all these crazy experiences. <laughs> it's, it's fake news. But so, Dr. Joe, I want to take you back to the 1990 World Cup team. Um, and, you know, for me, this is this is the genesis Legend. of modern Legendary. American soccer. You know, this is this is where uh, we we finally re-enter the world stage. And for any of listeners who aren't aware, 1990 is the first time we qualified in 40 years to go to the World Cup. And Dr. Joe was an instrumental part of that effort. So I would love to just hear the story of like how you got involved, the calls that occurred that brought you in and then working obviously with Tony Miola and that, that whole experience of him kind of breaking through as an unknown. Just give us the story. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, it's a fabulous story of the 1990 World Cup. Um, like you said, we hadn't qualified for 40 years uh, there was no professional outdoor league in America. So we had a few players that were playing abroad, but the rest were either that could make the team were uh, college players uh, or a few that were playing indoor. Um, there had been under Walter Chiswitz a good getting together of young players. We, we actually qualified for the Olympics, um, but Jimmy Carter, uh, chose not to send the USA to the Russian Olympics. So, so that, that group didn't get to go to the Olympics. But and on and about that time, we, we began to be able to compete in CONCACAF uh, for the most part against everybody except, uh, generally speaking, Mexico. Um, and so that was kind of new too. And we had like, maybe we could do this. Maybe, you know, the year, four years before we lost a game to Costa Rica in California that we only needed a tie to go to the World Cup. And we, we didn't get that tie, we, we lost 1-0. Um, so um, Lota Hacienda was the coach uh, right up until um, the time uh, we had a home and a home with Jamaica. Uh, we qualified with that. And then, then the Federation said, hey, we got a shot to go to the World Cup. We're gonna need a full-time coach. Lothar was part, very part-time uh, and couldn't leave his job in San Francisco. So they hired Bob Gansler as the full-time coach. Bob was uh, assistant to Walter Chiswitz on some of the youth teams. Uh, he had done very well with the uh, under 20 two years before in Saudi Arabia. Uh, about that same time, uh, teams began to think that the goalkeepers were different and needed special training. So as an assistant, they brought me in uh, to work with the goalkeepers, but also because of my experience with the five-a-side, I knew a lot of the players already. And, and, uh, and, I, uh, and so it was just me and Bob uh, in, the, in the qualifying uh, time. And so the you know, people were starting to gain interest. There were things called the Marlboro Cup, uh, other tournaments that we were in, uh, we traveled uh, to many countries to gain experience, uh, and finally came the uh, the qualifying uh, uh, stage. Uh, so, uh, 
when we started, we lost to Costa Rica away in our first game. Uh, Jeff Duback was the goalkeeper. He was played at Yale, and um, and Dave Anoli, Dave Anoli was his backup. And um, the, the players loved uh, Dave Anoli. He was a rah rah. Um, he used to put an American flag in the goal. He wore American flag <laughs> with sleeves. He was, you know, and he was like I said, big and strong. And he could dominate in CONCACAF. Uh, you know, he was, you know, could control the penalty area. Most any collision uh, between a player and Dave Anoli, the player got the worst of it. So he, he, he really dominated the penalty area for us. And we won the second game, uh, also against Costa Rica at home. Uh, and Dave saved a penalty to, to, uh, to get our first three points. But then something really happened. Uh, we were playing in the Marlboro Cup in Giant Stadium, um, and uh, it was uh, USA, Peru, Sporting Lisbon, and somebody else. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Was it Roma? No, no, maybe. But anyway, <laughs> what happens, uh, we call the team in, and uh, Vinoli shows up hurt. And Dubek gets, um, Vinoli shows up hurt, so now we need a backup. And we're in New Jersey, so who do, so let's call somebody local. So we call Tony Miola, who had who was playing at UVA, but lived in New Jersey. Da, da. He comes in, I warm him up, and da 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 da. I just got chills, Dr. Joe. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, so what then what happens, Jeff Dubek gets hurt against sporting so we have to put tony in the goal and this is the first game of a, a two-game thing so tony we secure the win with tony and then we have to play peru in the final we we shut out peru i think three zero um my only game is head coach um because um bob gensler had two sons graduating in Milwaukee, one from high school, one from college. So he went home to Milwaukee and gave me the team for that one game. And Count we, it. Yeah, it's in the book. Perfect because, record, baby. It's a record, one and know. And uh, and so now, you know, Tony's established himself. And um, for the rest of the time, he's he's our goalkeeper. And, and, uh, and you know, people forget that in the qualifying stage, everybody talks about Paul Caligiuri's goal against, you know, Trinidad, which was the big thing, the shot heard around the world, the whole thing. But Tony Miola had four consecutive shutouts in the last four games. Two of them were 0-0, okay? And if we, if he had given up one goal in, in any of, we would not have made uh, the World Cup. And that, you know, that plus Dave Manoli's save of a penalty kick against Costa Rica in the early stages of qualifying was why we made it to Italy. It's incredible. It's incredible. We look back on that, you know, during COVID when, when the game slowed down for a second, we took some time to watch some of those games. And, and just for me in particular, to get a little bit more familiar with the history of this team um, and how it became the team I see today. And that 1990 team um, is really what, where the story begins uh, for the team that we see today when did it feel that way at the time did it seem mm. to you like am i i'm a part of something really really special well that's also you know when you're a part of it you're there you know and so other people are saying it's really special and so but you're a part of it so you you're just trying to get the job done so to, you know what i mean so uh they like we when we went to trinidad for that last game we needed to win they only needed a tie. Um, but when we won that game 1-0, I mean, we didn't even have champagne in the locker room after the game. Trinidad brought us <laughs> champagne. They brought, Trinidad brought their champagne into the room. I, could, I can't believe that. Yeah. That's incredible. And we didn't know there was a behind-the-scenes story. And maybe the administrators knew, but it didn't get down, as I remember it, to the players or even to the coaches that if we didn't qualify, that they were gonna take away the 94 World Cup. If we didn't qualify for 90, then you know they couldn't defend having the World Cup 
in a country and now you're going to give an automatic qualification bid to you know to a team that hasn't quali who never qualified so there was that real pressure i remember the game very well um looking at the field we were at the we we're on the right bench you know um, on the right side of the half line and that's the goal that's the goal where the goal was scored okay so when and you if you see video you, when when Caligiuri hits that ball, he hits it on an arc, and it, it actually goes over the goalkeeper and hits the ground inside the goal before it hits the net. Are you with me? You know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, following. When he hits it, and with the goalkeeping experience that I had and seeing where the keeper was, because I'm like sitting like almost right even, uh, I jump up and I yell, trouble! You know, because I, I, you know, like he's going to have trouble with it, and 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 he did. He never touched it. He sure <laughs> did. It's amazing. It's amazing. I saw I saw that goalkeeper interviewed about that goal, and it, and it always kind of looked a little bit dodgy from his perspective. But when you look at the you know the physics of the shot and the actual circumstances that like you know the spin that Cal Jerry put on it and everything, it's a it was a very difficult save, and I, I think he can hold his head up high that he did he did a fine job that game. Goalkeepers back then didn't have the footwork that goalkeepers today have. So, because you didn't have to play the ball with your feet, you know, if you passed it back to the goalkeeper, they could, right. pick up, they could handle throw-ins from their own team. Now goalkeepers, for the most part, are field players who can also right. play. And so they have the kind of footwork where they can maybe get back and touch that ball over for a corner. Right. So tell us about um, the, the actual process of going to Italy with the team. And you mentioned in your Hall of Fame speech, which I recommend everybody check out. It was hilarious and great. You said that you brought your family. You know, your family was at all these different games with you throughout your career. And obviously that must have been a really special thing to share with them. So what was the experience of being with the team and also having your family there at the same time? Well, the family came... Um, the Federation did a really nice thing and, and uh, offered the family, families, excuse me, they put together a tour package for the families. So we, when we went uh, first to Europe in preparation for 90, we went to Switzerland. So, and, and this is well before the families arrived. And we played a game in Switzerland, uh, which we lost, but close. And then we played Liechtenstein, which we won I think, a very a big score, seven zero, I think. So, and then we bust down from Switzerland into into Italy. Um, Italy was uh, tough. So, let me see. When we stayed in Switzerland, we stayed at a beautiful resort. It was called Bad Ragaz. Bad meaning bath, and so it was like uh, springs, and you know, yeah. it was like a really resort and when we were uh in italy when the research was done for where we would stay in italy we were originally supposed to stay in corvacciano which is the italian training center where italy would also be but then we had the misfortune of being drawn into the group with italy so then they said no you can't you can't stay with us obviously you'd be watching our practices and all that so we now had to find a place last minute, uh, almost. Uh, um, and so the Italian government recommended this place in Terrania, which was a former Olympic training center. And I use the word former in capital letters. <laughs> it was really disappointing uh, for the players um, who had come from Switzerland in this nice resort to have to come to this place, which was old, decrepit, the field was bad, um, the food was being bust in. They didn't even use their own kitchen there. They were bringing, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was not a, not a good experience from that uh, from that perspective. Um, during the entire time we were there, we only got to see the families once. Uh, we were sequestered uh, in in uh, Terrania. There. There's, there's seven different security services in Italy, local police, this police, they're all with machine guns, they're all around you. I mean, you can't get out of the place and nobody can get near you. 
I mean, when we went after the first game was in Florence, the second game was in Rome. So we bust from Florence to Rome with a helicopter above us the whole, the whole time. And when we were going through the streets to get to our hotel, the bus would stop at the corner. The police escort that was ahead of us, they would get out with their guns and secure the intersection before the bus, before the bus would go to the, uh, to the next, before the next intersection. So what was it like? <laughs> I mean, sounds rough. You no, know, it was. I mean, you're still at the World Cup. I'm not complaining, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. It's not a complaint, but I mean, there were a lot of lessons learned, and um, you know, when when, um, like I said, we got to see the family once. We had a family day at Pisa. Uh, terrain here is a little bit uh, west of Pisa, by the, so we all met in Pisa and 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 got to see them. Um, you know, I have to say that, like, to think about what, you know, you, you all went through in that group and, and the groups before and after by five or six years, there was a, a period of time where being in American soccer was something not truly not for the faint of heart. And I don't think, <laughs> and, and I don't think yeah, that, sure. um, it is today, but when I look at players like Christian Pulisic, uh, and and Weston McKenney and and who I think are totally you know uh, strong individuals not take nothing away from them whatsoever but it just seems to have a little bit more of a saran wrap on it than it did at the time when when you were set in the stage um, do you it looks like that from the outside is that how do you how do you view the younger generation that's that's coming through now well obviously they're well ahead of us in terms of talent. Uh, we had, we had no players playing at major clubs or, you know, major, you know, except for maybe some goalkeeper, maybe Casey Keller and a couple other goalkeepers played in major, in major European competition. Um, and now we've got, we can feel the whole team of players from, you know, Europe that are, that are starting at their clubs. Obviously they're making lots of money. Um, back then um, we, we weren't making any money. Um, my salary at the, uh, as assistant coach for the national team was a hundred dollars a day uh, and, and only for the days you worked. So, uh, so, oh, Joe. No, no, it's true, but you didn't do it for the money. Right. So, of course. So, you know, but I know, I know how much, uh, I know. So that year I was away 190 days. Okay, and almost cost a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when they start marking the days on the calendar, you have to be careful. So, so I, there was nineteen thousand one hundred and dollars or something like that. But anyway, so um, what was it like in Italy? You know, we 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 didn't win a game. We got knocked out in the first round. We. We were in a tough group. We were with uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Italy, and Austria. So if you look at the um, games played after qualifying, the games played in preparation for Italy, Czechoslovakia lost, if not all of their games, most of their games. Austria won most of their games, including beating Holland in Holland. We didn't think we had a chance against Italy in Rome. So we, so we, you know, like, where are we gonna get points, right? So if we're gonna get points, we're gonna get them from Czechoslovakia. Uh, that was the thought process. So we played an open game and we got hammered. Uh, we got hammered in the air um and from long distance shooting uh two of two things which you don't see a lot in CONCACAF uh you know air, aerial challenges and long distance shooting right um and but we you know we we had two penalties called against us Winalda got sent off uh, all in this game um one penalty was uh the guy tried to chip Tony and Tony just held his ground. It was, it was already 5-1, I think, when it was called. So, so 
we just went into the Italy game with a whole different defensive organization, a couple of taller players, and, and we could have beaten Italy. Um, we, uh, they missed a PK, uh, and we had this goal chance on a free kick where Murray took the free kick, curved it, uh, Walter Zenga was the goalkeeper, and he bobbled it, and Vermes got the rebound and shot it and hit Zenga in the rear end. Um, and and otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, we got to die. When we were on the bus going down to Rome, and the, like I told you, we were stopping at the intersections, the fans were going like this, 10, 10. We were going to lose by 10, they were telling us. You know, we lost 1-0. And, and the, the Italian fans by 60 minutes began to whistle against their own team, uh, you know, for, for, because they were expecting this blowout. And I gotta, I find that story so profound, uh, Dr. Joe. And I also, I wanna also express my gratitude for the contribution that you made at that time. Because when I look at the, um, the little bits of success that we started to accumulate after that, um, you know, another game we watched over the break was the, the uh, kickoff uh, draw with Switzerland in 94. And then uh, we also watched the, the Mexico game in, in 2002. And I hope that, I hope that it feels from your perspective, like you're seeing the fruit of that labor when you see those kind of performances and those kind of results start to mount and the success of MLS now and everything. Because I think if there's no 90, I, I think 94 would have been 90. You know what I mean? Like that you, you accelerated the timeline for everyone towards a, a, a degree of success that I think surprised everyone on the world stage within a decade. Thank you for, but you know, I, I was a very, very, very small part of that. I mean, the, the uh, president of US soccer was a gentleman named Werner Fricka. Uh, he had confidence. Uh, he put up some of his own money. Um, he, had, you know, he had a construction business restaurant, and uh, he actually put up the letter of credit for the bid for '94 on his personal uh, letter of credit. So, um, you know, so there's there's lots of people to thank in many different many different ways, both on and off the field. Amazing. So I'm curious. Um, what is what would your advice be to this the current group of players the current coach Greg Berhalter um, all you and you may have literally be giving advice to these folks I, I don't know but no. it, I, okay <laughs> but so Come on Greg what, what the fuck man yeah let's we'll get we'll, we'll, I, you know we like nor, to nor have, nor have I been asked but that's okay <laughs> well you know what you know what Dr. Joe I'll ask for you next time but I need the sound bite from you so I can shove it in their ear if I ever get the chance what is your advice uh, to this group of players and staff as we build up to uh, to the next World Cup qualifying cycle and into the World Cup? Okay, so when we went to that first coaching school, we, we learned um, that there were different pillars of the game. Okay, and obviously, and I'm sure you've heard this before, you know, there's technique and our technique has improved uh, tremendously over the years. And there's tactics uh, and um, our coaching has improved tremendously over the years and knowledge of t coaching. But uh, one of the pillars of the game that people seem to forget about is uh, fighting power. And if anything that we had in 1990, while we lacked technique, tactics, uh, we had fighting power. Uh, what I saw in our effort at the last World Cup for which we didn't qualify, we had the technique, we had the tactic, we, we were missing that fighting power, that team spirit, that thing that people would expect from American soccer. The, 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 what even we had when Bradley, not even we had, we had it a lot when Bradley was coaching and Landon Donovan was leading the team on the field in a never say die attitude, even scoring, uh, you know, an extra time or whatever. Um, and so it's hard, I think, hard when you take players who are playing in all different parts of the world to develop that team spirit. It was certainly hard for Jurgen Klinsmann, I think. Uh, I think that team was, was missing that feeling, 
You know, if we're all in this together, we're gonna make this work. Um, it's an intangible, you can't measure it. Uh, but without fighting, um, without fighting power, you can't win. Um, and so, but you can't win with fighting power alone. Right. Either. You know, the, uh, the German coach that, and I'm not even saying fitness, this is not fitness, this is, I, so like the German spiritual. coach, yeah, the, the German coach used to say, let me say, he said, uh, uh, fitness is not everything, but everything without fitness is nothing. Okay, the same thing with soccer. You know, if you got everything, but you don't have fighting power, you, you're not gonna win the game. So how do you, I mean, you just, it's hard, it's difficult, but sometimes you bring a lesser player because that player is good for team chemistry, um, you know, and, and or has a leadership ability or, so um, I don't know if how, I don't know if that's helpful, but, but um, infinitely don't, so. Don't underestimate yeah. fighting power. Yeah, that makes sense to us. So we're, we're, we're going to get to uh, Dr. Joe reading some reviews, uh, which I think will be fantastic. I also want to make sure, Joe, that you have the chance to talk about um, number one soccer camps, which plays into all of this history because I think you started in 77 or so. So at the, you start this and then you're doing all this other, you know, amazing uh, exploits around the world. So Tell us, you know, the origin of it and where it's at today, and how people can get in touch with you if they're if they're interested in, you know, uh, being thank a part you. of it. Well, thank you. Um, you know, back in the day, soccer camps played a big role in the development of players in America. It's before the club system. You know, now we have clubs all over the world. So there were no, there were some ethnic clubs that had junior teams, but. But what, but what we know now is with every community having a soccer program and fields and everything. So there were camps and I would go from camp to camp as a goalkeeping expert and, and train the goalkeepers. And then finally I said to myself, what happens to these kids when I'm not here? They're, they're being used for shooting practice or target practice or whatever. So let me start a camp that just for goalkeepers. So in 77, we did, it was called number one goalkeepers camp. And we had, uh, because of the many clinics I was doing and working for the coaching school, we had 39 keepers from 13 states in, in Connecticut, we ran it. And we did a pretty good job, I guess, because the next year we had 200 goalkeepers all at once from 39 states and then by year three we expanded to Chicago and Texas and it got really it got it just got huge um, and then uh, I mean we produced at one time we had five starting goalkeepers in MLS that were campers um, uh, uh, Nick Romando, uh, Kevin Hartman, Jonathan Bush, um, uh, Matt Reese, Joe Cannon, uh, Dave Vinoli, wow. the national team. He was a five-year camper. Um, so it got really, really big. And then, you know, piece, our piece of the pie got less and less because other goalkeeper camps started. People who I taught how to teach started, <laughs> you, know, you know, the American way. Um, and so we added field players um, and we call them strikers. And we, the whole camp is done in front of the goal, small sided games with big goals and it's all go to goal, go to goal. So we say you come to camp, you get a thousand saves, a thousand scoring opportunities and you go home a little bit better player. Uh, but, but camp doesn't play the role in today's American soccer culture that it did in the seventies and eighties because now the kids can get quality, good coaching in their neighborhood. So, so um, it, you know, we still run it um, because we like to. Um, it's, it's um, and you know, I went last, this summer we had no camp the summer passed because of COVID. Right. The summer before I visited uh, our camp in Connecticut the last week of the summer and was really pleased um, with the um, results. And then, you know, was talking to the parents afterwards and the kids coming up and saying thank you and, and the parents, you know, 
you're going to have this next year. That, uh, you know, so we're still doing a good job on the field and uh, it's all about the field. Yes, and we've, we've both attended uh, many soccer camps in our, our lives and found it amazing and fulfilling and, you know, everything that, that you'd hope for from a, a sports experience. So thank you for doing that. And we'll put the link to your uh, to the website in the um, episode description. So, okay, I'm going to bring us to, to some reviews. If you, if you have a minute, um, I'm going to share my screen here. And so the, the origin so familiar with the, yeah, the context of this. Yes. Situation? Yeah. So the, the, well, and, uh, and the origin of this also for the listener is that Dr. Joe is on Fox. He cut, he pops on when there's an important refereeing decision and he comes in and he, he analyzes the referee. He, he, he judges the judger and we love this. We think it's, it's amazing and helpful for the viewer. So we were thinking, all right, Maybe Dr. Joe could judge the people who judge us, who are our, our listeners and leave, leave us reviews. <laughs> so we were hoping, Dr. Joe, that you could just basically give us, I'm going to read the review and then just give us, you know, your comments and maybe a rating out of five for the reviewer, if you will. Um, so I'll start with this one. Horace J said, it's an amazing soccer podcast. It's very fun to listen to, especially when drinking copious amounts of alcohol. Dr. Joe, what's your take? The alcohol must be uh, uh, being consumed by the, the listener there, right? It, so, I think so, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I think you got uh, both of you are very intelligent um, soccer people with intelligent questions. Um, you stimulated in me, I think, uh, some answers, which, if not entertaining, or at least, you know, try to be in <laughs> Um and so, and I promise that I haven't had a drink yet today. Um, and so I think uh, it's a little bit unfair that Horace J thinks that you need to have some <laughs> alcoholic um, <laughs> in order to enjoy your podcast, but it is what it is. All right, all right, sounds good. So the next one here, uh, also nice and simple. Soccer is Bush in the US. Almost everyone involved, obviously excluding present company is a low-grade moron. These guys only pretend that they are. Your take. So these guys only pretend like they are, meaning like they are what? We pretend this is the to be low-grade morons. I guess we pretend to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you don't have to pretend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, the, the first part is that I know I'm not a fan of soccer is Bush in the U.S. <laughs> there's still there's still some people that don't you know that don't uh, that don't get it. Um, they either they never played, um, and they you know they they don't understand that you can stay be um, enjoy a zero zero or a one zero game. Uh, even though, or even 2-2, two, two, which is in football would be 14-14. Um, they, we need to do a lot more education. On the other hand, there are so many sports in America um, that for a long time, we used to say, hey, we're gonna replace, we're gonna replace uh, ice hockey or basketball or whatever as a national, you know, pastime base. There's no reason to talk like that. There's plenty of room now um, for, you know, for good soccer all over this country. And we have good soccer uh, all over the country and, and um, millions and millions of people are playing it now. And if it was a Bush sport, they wouldn't be. Um, so that's my response. That's, a, that's a, a harsh critique of our reviewer. Very good. All right. Last one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on. Only pot I haven't gotten tired of. Do you love the USMNT? Vince McMahon looking interested. Do you wish that somebody who loved the Nats national team just as much as you, but puts more effort, would lay it all out for you? Vince McMahon again. Uh, do you enjoy self-aware hosts roasting themselves and Giassi's artists? Do you like regular segments introduced with cheesy sound effects? There's, we've got Vince McMahon doing all sorts of antics throughout this review. What's your take? Vince McMahon is a wrestling guy. <laughs> yes, the wrestling guy. Is that who we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to make of this one, quite frankly. 
<laughs> I don't get it. You know, All right, killer, killer cam jam. Uh, you're gonna have to do better next time. Tough words, tough words, but thank you for the review. Um, so Dr. Joe, uh, just to close this out, this has been a true honor and a, a pleasure for us. Uh, I'm sorry for keeping you a little bit over our time. And it, it's, yeah, amazing wisdom. I think uh, our, our fans are gonna love it and we look forward to talking to you again. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you so much, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, stay 